going to show you this morning that you can discourage the enemy. So just on a recap so we understand, we started off with this, and this is important. Once again, this is not the teaching, so to speak. I can teach. It's Paul said, I'm a preacher, teacher, and apostle. If I need to, I can. It says elders ought to be apt to teach. But usually the way God calls me is to emphasize something by the, by the Word of God, inspired Word of God. And what we started off with was Nehemiah. And we started off with, we want to talk about a man of faith. And you immediately think of Daniel. You think of David. You think of Paul. You think of these men of faith. And we don't think of Nehemiah. But Nehemiah had the kind of faith that you and I need today. Because he's in Shushan. He's in the captured land. And he's living in Babylon. And all the things of God are there, which is kind of surely where a lot of Christianity is today. You know, you can... Be in the world and fix everything up so it looks like the Lord. Especially in a city like Houston. Amen. I'm not pointing out there people. I'm talking about us too. We live in this city. And the city will get in the church or the church is going to get in the city. Amen. And we want to get in the city and, and, and affect things the way the Lord wants. But he's there and he's in a comfortable place. He's the cupbearer to the king. That means he doesn't just sip the king's wine and make sure it's not poison, although that was part of his job. But he was a confidant. To the king, if you study cupbearers, they, they were around him all the time. They heard everything and knew everything. So he had this privileged place, and obviously he loved God. But he, his brother comes through, and his brother's with some other Jews, and he asked him, how's Jerusalem? And when they tell him about the walls being down, about the burnt stones and the, 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 the gates down and the doors tore off their hinges, he doesn't just go, that's a shame. He begins to weep. And then he begins to fast and he begins to pray. Just the thought of that hurt his heart so bad. And that's what we need again. We need that kind of vision as Jason was talking about where you see the Lord. Yeah? You see things the way they should be. And you can't, we have to walk by faith because you can see the way they can be. Then you try to make them happen. It's never going to happen. Or you just give up and say it'll never be like that. What we have to do is stand in faith and say, God, thy will be done, thy kingdom come. Yeah? By your spirit. It's not by copying the New Testament. You can try that and say, well, they, let's just try to copy the New Testament exactly. But, you know, we live here in Houston. How many of you know that? I don't know, I don't know exactly how they met. They probably didn't have air conditioning, but we live here in Houston, and it's pretty nice to have air conditioning, right? So you can't copy it exactly, but you have to have that heart. I remember as a young believer reading where it says they gave up everything they owned and shared everything in common. And I, I got saved, this little Catholic boy and, and lost boy. So they told me to, when I discovered the Bible, they said, this is true. So I just would read it and believe it. So when I read, they gave everything up. I thought, do we need to do that? So I went to a preacher, preacher, spirit filled, you know, God can do miracles. And I said, they gave everything up. How should... Are we supposed to do that? Now, he could have said, listen, they were following the Holy Ghost, and we need to follow the Holy Ghost. And if God says give everything up, then you should do that. But what's God saying to you? This is, this is the example of the New Testament. They were following the Spirit. But he didn't say that. He just looked at me and said, oh, that was for then, not for now. And I was like, what? We can't pick and choose and say what's for then and what's for now. We have to, we have to walk by the Spirit of God and walk by what God is saying. So that we can begin to see the correlation between what was going on in the New Testament, what should be going on in our life. Yeah? We should be walking by the Spirit. We should be walking by God. The church should be a, a place not just of excitement and emotionalism, but an excitement that says, God, you're here. You're here with us. What are you saying? What are you doing? And so Nehemiah was that kind of man. He was that kind of man that, that knew the law, knew what the Scripture says, knew the heart of God. And when he heard that Jerusalem was, was burnt and the people were struggling, he didn't just say, oh, that's just too bad. If they only had a building program, if they only knew how to raise money, if they only had the right kind of worship group, if they only knew how to network things, then they'd be successful like us. But he began to weep because he knew that was what? What did we talk about? Location, location, location. That was the ground that you had to be standing on. Amen? And the ground we have to be standing on is Jerusalem. And what's the, the Jerusalem today? It's Jesus. Is that not right? We have to be on the ground of Jesus. So this is how we started off as an introduction. We were stunned, if we could say that, or should be, by this man 
who's got all this privilege, and all of a sudden he's going to risk his life to approach the king and say, to be sad in his presence. Because the king said, why are you sad? This is nothing but brokenheartedness. I don't think we understand how, how potentates worked. You couldn't, you couldn't have, a, have a, a, a depressed look when you're waiting on the king, right? Or like with Esther, she went to approach the king. She risked her life to approach the king. We can't talk about her this morning, but that's the other side of it. If you want to talk about a sister, we have all these mighty, powerful sisters in the kingdom today. But all we, but the, the, it comes down to, are you willing to risk your life, right, to simply approach the king? So he approached the king, and the, the king gave him permission, and he goes back. And we talked about some of that, didn't we? And they began to rebuild the walls. They began to do the work of the kingdom. And the work of the kingdom is what? The work of the kingdom is rebuilding the walls. The work of the kingdom is letting him rebuild our lives. Let him get, letting him begin to live through us the way he wants. Amen? Jesus said, the work, the work that the Father wants is to believe on the one that he sent. And we had that testimony from Jason about being a missionary and, and, and the work and then really seeing who Jesus was. So we get confused today about the work of the Lord. The work of the Lord is, is that rebuilding, that restoration of the kingdom and of what God wants. Amen? Some of you get discouraged in that. Brother Frank, I love Jesus, but you don't know. I keep finding things that, are, that he's dealing with in this, and God's still taking me back to here. And you get discouraged, but you don't realize that's the, that's the work of the kingdom. You need to worry when you meet believers that are like, praise God, everything's just wonderful. And I have this, this way I do things and everything's just right. And God's not dealing with you. The more you see him, the deeper you go in to what he wants. Amen? So we began to see that they began to work. These people began to work. Each family began to work on the portion of the wall that was there. Yeah, they began to pick up the stones. They began to put the stones back in their place. They began to clean them off. And we saw how immediately, didn't we, that the enemy began to come against them to try to defeat them and try to discourage them. How many of you noticed every time you make a real step, a real step towards the Lord for what He wants in your life, Satan will come against you. Yeah? We don't really understand that stuff. That's what I'm saying. We need, we need to be careful. I don't want to take a lot of time on this, but as, we, as things become more demonic, and how many of you know they are? I mean, there's things going on in our government. I, as, a, as an older man, I never thought I had presidents and people I disagreed with, but I always said we have to be respectful, whether we agree or not. But I never thought I'd be in a place that would say even things in our government. This is demonic. This is evil. You don't, you don't know how that breaks my heart. So as things get more and more like that, you're going to see many in Christendom focus on, on demonic things and exorcisms and on those things. I have stories I could tell you, but I don't tell them because... I don't want to focus on those things, but people will focus on those things. And everybody will start talking about, about spiritual warfare and the devil in the wrong way. Spiritual warfare has to do with this. Let's be very clear. Satan is only interested in stopping the glorification of Jesus. He's not worried about your next building program. He's not worried about you know, how you look to other Christians. He's not worried about what you think you're doing or not doing. Yes? What he's interested in is Jesus being glorified. Now, you, you can have some great move of God or something that, that men build and God's glorified in it if it's him, and that's great. But you can also have some poorly poor sister who's simply giving God what God wants. And Satan will come against that so hard. Amen? Oh, how I discovered this when I was overseas. We were in a little town. It was so, so difficult. In fact, I was reading Wesley's journals while I was there. And I got to a part and it said, it said, oh, Wesley went to Shrewsbury and he was unable to do any work there and moved on. I thought, Lord, I have, I'd already been struggling there for months. I thought, Lord, did you, if you sent me someplace that Wesley moved on from, what are you doing here with little old me? But God, Satan did not want God to get something established. Amen? And this is what God's after. And this is our dilemma. In a city like this, 
so much Christianity, so much prosperity, so much everything, that God wants to begin to divide the line and begin to say, I want to be glorified. And that's what he comes against. How many of you ever felt that? Anybody here ever felt like, why is he coming against me? A little old me. So how many times, especially on the mission field, I knew God was saying, go forward, take this ground, stand and preach this, do this. And I could almost hear Satan say, that'll cost you. That'll cost you. All his threats. But his threats come to nothing as long as we're relying on Jesus. Amen. So that's what's going on here. What's going on is these people are rebuilding. Amen. You know, when my wife and I got saved, that first year or so was glorious. It was so exciting. We were filled with the Spirit. We were in love with Jesus. But as we pressed in with Him, it seemed like after that, all we heard was no. We were talking about the other day. Because that correction began to come. No. You know, people look at us now and it's like, well, that's the way it was in your day. And you had all these kids and stuff. But I'm telling you, when we got saved, we were both career people. We had no kids. I had my whole plan for my life. I was going to be successful. 30 years old, we were going to have a townhouse and each have a sports car. And we were on our way there. I had my first house at 21. I was in business at 22. But God came along and it was like, nope, we're going to restore. He began to take things apart and to rebuild his way. Amen? See, we're so stuck. If we have faith, we're so stuck on what we see. Yeah, what we see. Do I look good? How's my bank account look? How's my job look? How do I look? What's going on? But God is interested, and I know we say this, but God is interested in what? In the inner man. This is an inward journey, people. This is not an outward journey. It's an inward journey. And you can certainly look good on the outside, not look good on the inside. That's why I knew it was always important for me to have brothers I could walk with and have people who could see into my life. I, I don't want to, you know, it's easy to be to be a preacher and it's like walk on some platform, preach to people, then go to lunch and go home. I want people to be in my house. I want people to know how I live and what I'm doing. God wants no pretense. So I was telling someone the other day about the little children in, in the meetings or whatever. And yesterday at the end, I said, we always have the children in the worship. And my kids will tell you, when I preached, I always put my kids on the front row. I was like, let's just get it right out in the open. Everybody can know who's the worst kids in the church. Maybe it's mine. I don't know, but we're going to put them all on the front row. Because we don't need to hide. Somebody say amen. Yeah, we don't need to hide. We don't need to hide. That's why the worship and the preaching should open our hearts. Sometimes you can use that to hide from. I worry sometimes that in, in some of our assemblies, we use this sweet little worship so that people can come and say, I feel good and I can go in and kind of hide in the back. Worship is something where you throw your heart open. How can you hide? It's like just out loud telling, like all of a sudden you're out on the street, you tell, you tell that person you love, that guy or that girl or your wife, hey, I love you. It gets kind of embarrassing, right? That's the way it's supposed to be in the kingdom. That's what real worship is. You're saying, I love you. Now, you might not have to be as loud as somebody. You could be quiet, right? I'm always trying to sing louder than Ryan O'Farrell. Sometimes I always can't do it. Where is he? Yeah? There he is. Blesses me. That's where I want to be, Ryan. I'm not picking on you. It always blesses me when the congregation starts singing louder than up up there. I'm like, now we're worshiping. Now we're worshiping. This is an inward journey. And when you take that inward journey, Satan's not happy. He's going to throw everything he can against you. Amen? But let's not be discouraged. Let's turn to Nehemiah 6. Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem and Abrian, the the Arabian, sorry, and the rest of the enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein through that time. I had not, but I, at that time, I had not set up the doors. That Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. 
And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? So what had they done? done? They had built the wall so there was no what? Breach. There was no breach. That meant the enemy's not getting in now. You've got to establish things so the enemy's not getting in. You can have all the marriage counseling in the world. You can go to that woman who's going to counsel you, and that's what marriage counseling usually is. It's one woman. It's, it's, it's two women beating up on one man. I don't know. You want marriage counseling? Find an old couple in the church who survived for a long time and got the wisdom of God and have the cross and get advice from them. You don't need advice from somebody who's taken a quick course. But the biggest thing we need in, you need in your marriage is close the breaches. Don't let the devil in anymore. Amen? Don't let the devil in. Your thought life, you get to struggling and struggling. Yeah, the enemy's still out there. They're always going to be attacking you, but you close the breaches. You begin to shut those breaches. The breaches were shut. That makes him angry. Do you see this? Do you see what real warfare is? Yeah. How, those people in Shushan, those people in Babylon, they're not even paying attention to Jerusalem because it seems unimportant. What are y'all doing? But it's God's ground. It's God's ground. The individual says, I'm going to make him Lord. I'm going to, I'm going to make him my everything. Satan's not happy. The couple gets together and gets on their knees and says, God's going to be everything. The brothers in the church go and pray and say, God's going to be everything. The sisters get together. God's going to be everything. The church gets together and say, we want God to be everything. It's going to get tough. But our God's greater. Amen. So the breaches were shut. But the, the doors weren't up yet. What does that mean? That means defensively, they're ready. That means God's beginning to get what he wants. But doors mean going in and out. Jesus said, I'm the door. And those that can come in and go out. Go out. The door means there's going to come a time when those doors are in place. Then people can begin to come in. And people can begin to go out. And that's the evangelism and the things God wants. Do you see that? That's what he's doing. You have to have doors. I was talking about the other day, even in the church, the door is Jesus. Come in, but come into Jesus. I don't understand when preachers are like, we had 50 people visit our Sunday. It's great. Well, that's good. Did they meet Jesus? Did they really hear about Jesus? Oh, we don't care. We've just got them in the midst, and that's all we care about. Well, I don't know what you've let in. What have you let in? Yeah? What have you let in? Everybody's always welcome through the door. And that's, that's, that's a fact, and that's truth. No matter where they are, what their past is, or how they're even living right now, they're always welcome. But they need to come and hear the truth of Jesus. Amen? And you don't have to force anything on them. But today we have people who are living in sin and they actually live in the church for months and months and months and months and weeks and years. And there's never that conviction that comes that settles upon them. Yeah? I had one sister years ago. She started coming to church. She was even involved with a a Christian organization at her campus. And she was coming, sitting on the front row. And after about four or five weeks, she stopped me at the back. She said, Frank, I've discovered something. I said, what's that? I'm not saved. I said, wonderful. Now you can get saved. That sister got saved. She's serving Jesus today. But she had to be where she's hearing the word of God. So now the enemy comes to discourage them. And what do they do? These are, this is Moab. Yeah, there's an Arabian in Moab. You know what the Moabites were? The Moabites were, came about because the daughters of Noah committed incest. Right? Every time you see an enemy of God, any time you see, see where it's Samaria or Moab or anyone that's an enemy of God, it always starts with this. It's not just the sin of incest. It was the sin to begin with of a lack of faith. Yeah, you've got to make something happen. We've got to have faith. We've got to believe God. Amen. If they'd have believed God, God would have continued Noah's line. How? Well, we don't know, do we? Because they got involved. So always there's a little bit of the lineage of God in there. There's always some religion that will come against that life. Amen. Satan doesn't want the life of God. You think you're seeing persecution now. Well, now we're seeing lawsuits and we're seeing things in the world coming against the church. And those are very real. But the real hatred starts with this, not with what you believe, not that you're just making 
a certain stand, but when they see life, Satan can't stand that. It's the thing he fought against from the very beginning. Stop the life. Stop the life of God. Kill the prophets. Stop the preachers. Even when Jesus was being born, had all those babies killed. Stop the life until it came to Christ himself. And then he had him beaten, a crown of thorns, humiliated, crucified. Saw his breath taken out of him and thought, I have won. There is not going to be the life of God on this earth. Three days later, Satan's whole plans were destroyed and have stayed destroyed. I'm trying to encourage you this morning. You say, Brother Frank, you don't know my problems. You don't know what a mess I am. I want to ask you something. Is there life inside of you? Do you have the life of God? Come on. That's why Brother Mark blesses me. Maybe last Sunday we came in and Mark was standing up. Sometimes Mark has tough weeks. Do you, Mark? But, they, but Satan is not going to beat the life out of him if God has anything to say about it. Amen? Yeah. He's after that life. Not just that, you're, you, that there's a lot of activity in the church or you're loud or whatever, but that there's life. I just happen to be kind of an exuberant, loud guy. You can blame it on my Italian heritage, but it's what happens when that stirs inside of me. Now, I've been one of the brothers and seeing the stirring of God, and they're quite quiet, but there was no denying there was life. Amen? So these guys come, and the first thing they try is a little bit of compromise. The first thing they try is, hey, would you meet with us? We'd just like to meet and gather together. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? There's some unity. Nothing ever, nothing ever got me in a lot of trouble, did it, Mary? As other when they were having ecumenical unity meetings in England, I got invited and I was like, I don't think I'm going to go. I wasn't against it. I just prayed about it. And the Lord said, uh-uh. From that moment forward, Tobiah and Sanballat and them came against me in ways you wouldn't believe. Just because I'm like, I'm not going over there. So they come, they come to Nehemiah and they said, let us meet. And what does he say? This is this guy's heart again. We need to all pray. Give me a Nehemiah heart. He goes, no, I'm doing a great work. Are you doing a great work? Are you doing a great work? Well, Brother Frank, I'm just a simple person. I'm not doing anything. You're not doing anything? Are you loving God? I'm loving God. I'm praising Him. I'm praying. I'm showing up. Man, you're conquering things. Amen? Oh, I'm just, I'm just a mother, a housewife. What am I doing? My gosh, what are you doing? You're nurturing, raising future prophets and preachers. And men are going to serve God and women are going to serve God. That's what you're doing. Amen? Don't underestimate it. He says, we're doing a great work. How many of you thought that? You're doing a great work. We need to believe we're doing a great work here. Not in size, not in budget, not in anything outward, but if it's on the ground of Jesus, it's a great work. Amen? Jason, Jason, quote, thank you, Larry. Jason quoted from the book of Revelation yesterday. I always love it because here's John. Now, they, they, they figure he's maybe 90 years old. He's on the island because of the Lord. I mean, in other words, they pitched him on this island because of his walk with Jesus. He's done. Who's even going to know about him? Who's ever going to hear from him again? He didn't know he was, we were going to have this in our hand. <coughs> and on the, on the Lord's day, I saw the Lord. Just this old man sitting at the feet of Jesus having this vision. And how did we get this? See, that's how God works. God doesn't need, we're like, we have to, we have to employ all the, all, the, all the technology of the day. And I'm not against technology. It's very helpful, but it's like, we have to employ all that. We have to do this. We have to do that. I'll even have people tell me, Brother Frank, we need to, we need to do sound bites. You have to have a big combo screen and you have to only talk for 15 minutes because people can't keep their attention. Do I have your attention this morning? I think I do. Not because of me, but because the, the Spirit of God, like Paul said, it was by the Holy Spirit. He meant the Spirit on me and the Spirit on you. When I preach, I, I pray God have the anointing on me, but I'm always like, God, let have the anointing on them too. Yeah? So he tells them, no, I can't. I can't leave a great work and come down. Yet they sent four times after this, and I answered them the same manner. Then Sanballat, his servant, said unto me, in a like manner, the fifth time in an open letter. Now, it changes. First Satan comes up, it's like, hey, you can do this. We can do that. When I decided to shut my business down, 
when God had called me to the ministry. I'd been trying to extend my line of credit at the bank because things were beginning to happen. We were beginning to, to make some money. And they had, they had turned me down to extend it, which didn't matter now because I was going to close it down. After the, the day after I decided to close my business down, and it took me six months to do that, the phone rang. I picked it up as my banker. Hey, Frank, what's going on? I said, well, I'm just here working. What's up? And Listen, we've reconsidered. We'll extend your line of credit. I knew. That's the devil. I knew it was the devil. I didn't tell him that. He was a nice guy. I said, no, I don't think so. What? I'm closing this place down. What? I'm telling you, I was beginning to burn all my bridges. Right? I know I was very young, but I had owned property with my brothers. I had already established myself as a young businessman. Now, you start doing the things I was doing. I was, I was canceling everything out. You start closing things down. You start denying these bankers. They're like, we're done with you. But I knew that was the devil trying to tempt me back. So they were trying to tempt him. And once, once the devil realizes that that's not going to work, then it's just full front, front, frontal. He's going to come against you. And here's what happens. He sent him a letter. It says, it's reported among the heathen and Geshmu that says that you and the Jews think to rebel for which cause you're, you're building this wall and that you might be a king according to these words. You've also appointed prophets to preach of thee in Jerusalem, saying there's a king in Judah. Now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. And I said unto him, there's no such thing done as you're saying, but they're feigned out of your own heart. And they all made us afraid, saying, Their hand shall be weakened from the work that it may not be done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. So he, now he's just going to have an attack. And what does he accuse him on? Personal ground. You just want to be a king. Can you see how that could work? There's Nehemiah. He's doing all this. They're accusing him. You just want to be a king. You want to be Jerusalem. You're having prophets and priests making you a king. You're doing this for yourself. Just not true. His answer was no, not true. That's where some of you get stuck. God calls you to do something. You start stepping out. God asks you to sing a song or something. You go to do it. And maybe, maybe there's, there's that little bit of accusation of, oh, you're just, you just want, you're just thinking to yourself. You have to decide, is that really true in your heart of hearts? If it's no, then tell him no. You're a liar. You're a liar. They did it to do what? Weaken your hands. Weaken your hands. But he said, oh, Lord, strengthen our hands. We get weak with working on the kingdom, do we? We get tired. He wants to weaken our hands. What did God tell Jeremiah? Jeremiah started complaining. Jeremiah said, they're persecuting me. They're talking about me. They're accusing me. They're doing all these things against me. And God came along and rubbed Jeremiah's head and said, Jeremiah, I understand that. You're a prophet. It's tough. Yeah? Poor guy. It's not what God told him. God said, Jeremiah, if you've run with the footmen, what are you going to do with the running of the horses? If you get upset in a time of peace, what about in the swelling of the Jordan? Now, God wouldn't be in harsh, but he knew you need some strength. It says the Holy Ghost is our comforter. The Holy Ghost shores us up. The Holy Ghost comes from the Father. We're not used to a Father's love, do we? That says, look, get up, you can make it. You can do it. We have to admit, and I don't want to spend too much time here, but, but it, because you know it's true, we live in a generation that, that isn't, used to, isn't used to any of this. Amen? Usually, usually every 50 years, America is involved in some kind, of, some kind of a military conflict. We're way overdue. We're way overdue. It's, it's been a while since World War II. Just think about it. All those men came home. All those men came home. From, they understood conflict, and they were all functioning, many of them. They raised families. America was prospering because discipline and warfare and those things were part of their life. But we've been so far removed from all that. Yes? We have to admit it. It hurts me to say it, but men have never been weaker, have they? Men have never been weaker. They've allowed themselves to just completely be weak. It says in Jeremiah, one of the judgments upon a, a nation. No, not Jeremiah, Isaiah 3. You read that chapter, you'll weep because it's, it, to me it epitomizes America. It says children will rule over you. and I mean, women will rule over you and children will abuse you. That's exactly where we're at. We've never had men be weaker. 
And with all the empowerment for women, women can do everything. They can do this. They can come. They can do. We've never had women, women be weaker than they've ever been. That's what I tell my grandchildren. Or I tell them when for grandma left this earth, I'd say, have you heard of a superwoman? Well, I'm telling you, it's not that lady who fits into that outfit. Superwoman is your grandmother. Superwoman is your mother. That's who superwoman is. Yeah. Because we don't have that tenacity. And the reason we don't have it is not because we need to be tougher. Let me be clear. To be tougher will never do it. Because it'll just be you. What we need is, somebody say it, faith. We need that faith. And this is what he prayed. God, strengthen our hands. Because he knew the enemy's trying to, to weaken us. We've been praying, haven't we, Larry, on, on the Friday nights and stuff. And Anthony, we've been praying, send the prodigals back. We had some prodigals in here yesterday. Send some prodigals back. Why? Because prodigals don't need to go to that backsliding man or woman and say, you know, you're not serving God. God's unhappy with you. What's happened? It's simply this. You got weak. You got beat up. Things happened. Your hands got weak. Satan has just convinced you that either you're not worth getting up or you can't do it. They need to be told, God's waiting for you to come home. Stand up. Strengthen your hands. Amen? And isn't that what happens to us? How many of you have seen it in your own life? You're going along and all of a sudden you'll waste a week or you'll waste two weeks. Some waste a lot more than that. It's like haven't been to a meeting in a while, haven't really prayed in a while, haven't really done this in a while. Why? Because Satan comes along to lie. Satan comes along to discourage you. But I'm going to tell you something I learned. The older I get and the longer I walk in this, you know who God gives up on? Nobody. God gives up on nobody. I'm seeing men and ones that have that even been away from God 20 years, 30 years, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm hearing from them again because God gives up on nobody. Why? And let me tell you his heart. Let me tell you why. Because there's people over here in Shushan and Babylon, and they've got their temples, and, and everything seems nice, and they have the things of God. It's not that they're not Jews, or there's not that these people aren't Christians. In, in the day and age we live, they're doing good things and all, all that's going on. But God's heart is Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. God's heart is Jesus. So this person, this Christian, they do everything right. They give just right. They pray just right. They're involved in everything. They are really good Christians. You can see their posters up there on when you're driving down 45. There's the face of those pastors and their beautiful wives. They're smiling at you, spending $30,000 on a billboard to try to convince you of something. They look good. But give me the, the man or the woman who's saying, look, I'll go back to Jerusalem. I'll just get down. God, what would you like me to do? I'm unworthy of anything else maybe. But how would you like me to pick this stone up? How would you like me to dust it off? How would you like me to help up this brother or sister who's got a heart to serve you? I'll go. God says, that's who I'll give the strength to. That's who I'll give the strength to. Amen? Don't ever underestimate this prayer. God, I have no strength. But could you help me get up and move towards you? Man, God will do it. That's why sometimes people don't understand me too. It's like, well, I, what did this brother struggle or this sister struggle? It's sometimes I have to keep quiet because like, you don't know. You haven't spent time with them. And I can see deep down in their heart they want God. They got struggles. They got problems. And Satan's throwing everything at them. But they want God. Yeah. I've seen people start off magnificently on fire and never count for God. And I've seen other people just struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle. And then after time and the cross, all of a sudden it's like, look what God's doing. We need that tenacity, right? And, I, and like I said, I want to spend a lot of time on this because it gets, the, even in the world, they can say it, the whole snowflake thing, but it's true. We have children that just, and people, young people coming up, they don't understand tenacity. They don't understand hard work. They don't understand that something's worth fighting for. As my friend Kim used to say years ago, is what you're living for worth dying for. This is the Christians we have today. They will come in and shout like, yes, all for God. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, the, the, the meeting's going to go more than 45 minutes. Can't do it. I have to pay attention to a child during the worship. Can't do it. My wife not want, might not want to do that. Can't do it. What? I have to get out of my pajamas and actually go to church and can't just have church in my pajamas watching a video? Can't do it. But I want to read these these books that talk about laying your life down. 
We lay our life down every day when we, when we just surrender to Him. Amen? Tomorrow Oscar comes. We've walked together for 20 years, and we have so much more than they have down there. It doesn't really bother me because I've been on the mission field. I lived, over, lived on the mission field, and I also know that this is where God wants me. But I've learned through, through things that laying down your life doesn't mean that you have to get rid of everything. It doesn't mean you can't have a nice car. It doesn't mean you can't have that job. If it's what God wants, lay your life down. Amen? This is the city we're called into. Right? So there'll be, there'll be trappings that look like this city, but it's where our, where our heart's at. Amen? So we asked them to strengthen their hands. So they kept trying to get to him. I have to move on. Then, then, then they used another, another uh, of their disciples to try to get him to meet him in the temple. Come on, we'll meet with God. None of this moved Nehemiah. Why? Because Nehemiah has seen what God wants. He's seen what God wants. No, this is what God wants. Some of you get pulled in so many different directions. That's what Paul called it, every wind of doctrine. Oh, over here is this. Oh, it's like, you see Jesus. None of that stuff will mean anything to you. You'll be sticking to him. Amen? I like verse 11. I have to read it to you. Well, I verse 10. Afterwards, I came into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Delilah, the son of Methetelbiel. Methetelbiel, these are hard to pronounce, who was shut up and he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple for they will come and slay you in the night. They will come and slay you. And he's, and I said, should such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save my life? I will not go. This is near my heart. This is the kind of heart we need. This is the kind of heart we need. We're educating professors. We have churches filled with professors who are ready to discuss theology. Filled with sisters who all want to counsel everybody. And what we're missing is the grunts. That's what they call them. What we're missing is just a foot soldier that says, I'll go. You're not smart enough. I'll go. You're not handsome enough. I'll go. You don't sing good enough. I'll go. God's like, that one. Send that one. Heart is everything. So they said, come on, let us go into the temple. Can you see that fear? Of that attack of the enemy. Satan will attack us in the way he knows. Amen. He'll lie against us. Try to put us in fear. You go this way, you'll have no money. You go this way, you'll be alone forever. You go this way, this will never happen. You go this way, that'll never happen. It's time to have faith in God. Amen. I love when he said, should such a man as I flee. Can you say that this morning? You should say that in faith. Oh, Brother Frank, listen, it's not time for false humility. Do you want God this morning? Yes. Okay. You can list all, all your problems later on today, and God can take care of them. But all he wants to know this morning is, are you willing? Yes. Not if you're able. He will make you able. Are you willing? Should such a man as me flee, I will not. Verse 16. And it came to pass when all the enemy heard thereof, and all the heathen were round about us saw these things, that they were much cast down in their own eyes. For they perceived these, that this work was wrought by our God. There it is. The enemy was discouraged. The enemy was discouraged. Do you want to discourage the enemy this morning? Hold your ground. Keep building. Keep saying it's a lie. When you feel you can't take another step, Look to Jesus. Amen? Say, Brother Frank, you don't struggle like that. I'll tell you, you better know the things we're doing. There's many times I feel like I just can't. I can't take another step. I mean, God, I don't know if I can go on. But as, La as Brother Larry said, when he said, I don't have a choice, I don't have a choice because I've seen him. Amen? So we're going to go on. And God's going to be glorified. Can you see his wisdom in it? God's going to be glorified in this place. And who's going to get the glory? God is, because that's why God uses a broken people. That's why God uses a Nehemiah. That's why God uses those people in Jerusalem. Because they know they can't stand up and say, 
We did this. There's even times here I'll look around and tell Melody or Rachel will be working here. I'll say, when did all this happen? We don't have like rich benefactors. We're raising money. I, I don't know how it happens. God did it. You see, you can say, God did it. God did this and God did that. And you can tell. It's like, oh, you, you really did that, but you just want to put his name on it. When God's really done it, you don't have to, you don't have to apologize for your blessings or your difficulties. You'll know God did it. Amen? God put you in this city and God bought you that house. You don't have, you just give him the glory. You don't have to apologize for it because you know it's obvious God did this. The enemy was discouraged. The enemy was discouraged. You see, that's what I'm encouraging you with this morning because it seems like the onslaught just keeps coming and just keeps coming and just keeps coming and just keeps coming. And this is what he's trying to do. Your life is in God's hands. Amen? Is that not right? We don't fear the one that can kill the body, but that can kill the soul. Satan can't steal your salvation. Satan can't steal that life of God. But he can certainly discourage you, and get you to pull back, and get you to begin to stop. But God wants us to know this morning, hold your ground. Say, I'm doing a great work. I want that to be in your heart. I'm doing a great work. Yeah? You say, Brother Frank, I haven't even been coming here that long. All I'm doing is showing up. You're doing a great work. Just keep doing what God's telling you to do. And when Satan comes to tempt you, you need to say, what? Should a man, should a woman like me flee? Should I run? No, I'm not going to. Stand your ground. Sometimes having done all to stand, it says in Ephesians, having done all to stand, stand. Aren't you glad that next word's there? Having done all to stand, I've done all this, God. Oh, stand. See? I'm not that educated of a man. I just can read my Bible. Mama taught me to read. Actually, Sister Mary Hatchett taught me to read. But I can read. And that's where I read my Bible. It's like, I've done everything I can do, God. I can stand. Oh, stand a little longer. Amen? Stand a little longer. It's what we need to, have to tell each other. We don't like to hear it at times. I need some special counseling. I need that special prophetic word. I need something to help me keep going. Brother, what's the word for me? Keep standing. Oh. Keep standing. The enemy was cast down. Don't you love that? Made me want to start dancing. The enemy was cast down. Amazing. The enemy was cast down. He was discouraged because the work was going on. There's more to this story. Ezra comes into the picture. Ezra is the story of Ezra. There's a lot more. Zechariah, Zephaniah, Haggai, so much more. About the building of the temple, there were three, three caravans or three times they came back. But the work continued. Because God's interested in the Jesus being glorified. How many times in the past I've picked up a book maybe that no one's, that isn't even published today about some missionary or some preacher. Usually it's a preacher that would refuse to sell his books and there'll be gold in it. Be, I'll be seeing Jesus. And no one would even know this guy. But this guy had his eye on Jesus and his feet on Jerusalem. That's what counts. Let's discourage the enemy this morning. Let's keep standing until he's discouraged. He's not going to give up. But when he sees this work is of God, he's discouraged. If he knows it's of man, come on. They'll give up sooner or later. Yeah. That's the one thing that always kept me going overseas. No matter what happened, I knew God had called me. So I just couldn't give up. If God's called something, then when Satan sees it, he knows this is going to be tough. So let's pray. Then I'm going to ask Jason to come up and dismiss us. Pray, pray a blessing over us. We're going to have lunch and then he's going to go and go back to his mission field in Arkansas. Are you, are you going to agree with me?
Agree with me this morning. Lord Jesus, we do come to you this morning. We trust you. Everybody here is in different circumstances, different things, but we have this in common. We love Jesus. And we want Jesus. So Father God, that we're doing a great work. There's a great work going on in our lives. Father God. And when we come together as a church, there's a great work, not in what we're doing or the buildings or budgets or bands, but a great work just with inside the souls of individuals. That's what's important. And God, we do ask you, we boldly ask you to touch this city. Yes, from this, this little place here, God, touch this city. And since such a man or woman as us flee, the answer is no. We will not move from this ground. Amen.